and we are privileged to extend that hospitality to one another. I have a few announcements to make. Next Sunday is the congregational meeting. Um, there seems to be some kind of disturbance. Is there, is there something we can help you with?
accepting his power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. We confess to you, Lord God, and for one another that we have sinned. We have failed to do our neighbors and ourselves by listening to the voices of those around us instead of your voice. Call us once more to faithfulness and courage that we may serve you and others more fully and be truer to the image in which you created us. Give us and empower us with your spirit to move forward in our life in Christ and in our openness about who we are.
brings us into our prayer time together. Gary Ellis asks for continued prayers for Cindy. Doctors are pleased with her progress, but still has a ways to go. And also, Paul and Emmy Banwert ask for prayers for Paul's sister, Leela. At this point, taking very little nourishment and not speaking clearly and has COVID. Uh, Tuesday would be her 94th birthday. Her earthly home is West Bend, Iowa. So let's join together in prayer as God's beloved children. We praise and thank you, O Lord, that you have fed us with your word, grateful for your gifts and mindful of the communion of your saints. We offer to you our prayers for all people. God of compassion, we remember before you the poor and the afflicted, the sick and the dying, prisoners and all who are lonely, the victims of war, injustice and inhumanity and all others who suffer from whatever their sufferings may be called. O Lord of Providence, holding the destiny of the nations in your hand, we pray for our country. Inspire the hearts and the minds of our leaders that they, together with all our nation, may first seek your kingdom and righteousness, so that order, liberty, and peace may dwell with your people. O God, the Creator, we pray for all nations and peoples. Take away the mistrust and lack of understanding that divide your creatures. Increase in us the recognition that we are all your children. O Savior God, look upon your church as it, in its struggle upon the earth, have mercy on its weakness. Bring to an end its unhappy divisions and scatter its fears. Look also upon the ministry of your church. Increase its courage, strengthen its faith, and inspire its witness to all people, even to the ends of the earth. Author of grace and God of love, send your Holy Spirit's blessing to your children here present. We ask that you intercede in the prayer requests that have been spoken aloud this morning, but also those that we keep in our hearts. All these things we pray through Christ, our only Savior, who has taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us
Zerubbabel has done it. He did it. He built the temple. Ezra has begun to show the people they need to become a community of the people of God again. Now, enter Nehemiah, the cupbearer of the king to Persia. He says a prayer after he hears what has been happening to the people of Jerusalem. <coughs> I shall read to you from the first chapter of the book of Nehemiah. This is the word of God. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hecaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the twelfth year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, and on I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard the, these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you that day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Now I confess the sins that we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by grant him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. The word of the Lord. Pray with me, please. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. They can have all of the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. I was the cup bearer to the king. Is how Nehemiah ends the first chapter of the book of his name. Cup bearers were often close confidence of their masters. There's a story from Genesis when Joseph is in prison in Egypt and he can interpret a dream by the cupbearer to Pharaoh. And when that cupbearer is returned to his status, eventually he remembers Jacob and, and, and gets him released from prison. Cupbearers were important people. They were not only the ones who poured the drinks, Sometimes they're the ones who had to taste it first. They were organized. They organized royal parties, and they selected the wine. We might think of them today more as butlers, someone who runs the estate. And of course, if you have ever read a mystery novel, you know that it's usually the butler did it. There have been powerful depictions of 
felonious butlers even before Arthur Conan Doyle, and of course it had become a trope, a stereotype of detective stories. This all-powerful man, it's usually a man, behind the scenes, pulling all the levers, running the machinery, all the while standing calm and quiet in the background. It's like the furniture. One might as well say, the dining room table did it. And this cliché became so popular that art critic Willard Huntington Wright, writing under his pen name of S.S. Van Dyne, came up with the 20 rules for writing a mystery novel in the early 20th century. Rule number 11 was, the butler never did it! <laughs> now there are a lot of depictions of butlers in our popular culture. They're wiser or smarter than those they work for. Maybe that's why they seem so sinister. And yet, they're played for laughs too. In Our Man Godfrey, I, I saw that a couple of months ago, it's a great movie, William Powell, Carol Lombard, uh, Powell plays Godfrey, a millionaire, masquerading as a bum, to get to the truth is what is happening in his building, uh, in his building projects. Carol Lombard sweeps him off the streets, wants to help this poor bum, and makes him her butler. Hilarity ensues. And then there's Jeeves and Wooster. Uh, Jeeves saves the day for hapless Bertie Wooster time and time again. And if you've ever seen an episode of Downton Abbey, you know it's really Mr. Carson who runs the entire estate. And who could forget the Green Hornet and Cato? <laughs> Perhaps the most portrayed butler in film history is Alfred Pennyworth, the, the butler to Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman. He's, at this point, the actor's name is Alan Napier, but of course there have been several Alfreds, just as there have been many Bruce Waynes. There was Michael Goff, who played Alfred to Michael Keaton and George Clooney. Michael Caine was Alfred to Christian Bale's Batman. Uh, Sean Pertry played Alfred, as sort of a Batman prequel. And Jeremy Irons to Ben Affleck. All great Alfreds, all great butlers. But perhaps my favorite is Benson. <laughs> not sure. If you remember him, uh, uh, he was played by the incomparable Robert Guillon. You know, uh, Raftiki the, from the Lion King, the one that holds up Simba, right? He was also the second ever Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, too. He could really sing. Um, in Benson, though, uh, the zany, zany comedy of Benson, the only one, he was the only one with a level head and always saved the day at the end of the show. Guillaume even won an Emmy for the best comic actor in 1985 for the role. Now, throughout the series, Benson evolves from being the butler to being the state budget director to the lieutenant governor, and if the show had not been canceled, Benson would have won the race for governor itself. Now, Nehemiah said he was the cupbearer for the king, which means he was a pretty big deal. In a case of art imitating life, Nehemiah himself eventually becomes the governor of Judah. The king must have seen a lot of potential in Nehemiah. In the opening chapter that we just read, Nehemiah finds that his ancestral home is in bad shape. And yes, there is a new temple. Yes, Ezra has been trying to gather the people. But you see, the city's walls are broken. That was important. You couldn't be a respectable city state at the time unless you had walls, walls and gates. Professor Joanna Adams in Decatur, Georgia, says that when Nehemiah got into town, he sent out a secret scouting party to make an inspection of the walls. And in spite of the grief he was being given by the enemies of the Jews, who were not only all around the town, but now inside the town itself, he organized work crews. His gift for organization as running the king's palace was paying off. He put priests on the first week detail, uh, work detail, so everybody could see this was a holy task. After all, priests really only work, you know, one day a week, right? <laughs> when they're not 
organizing bingo games or going to potlucks. Another great butler, Red Butler. Didn't say he didn't he say he was a sucker for lost causes? Yeah, I think rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem must have seemed like a lost cause because Nehemiah faced a lot of opposition. Pastor uh, Adams writes that the priests were not the only one into whose hands Nehemiah put a hammer and a nail and all those wheelbarrows he put in bricks and cement because incredibly the wall was finished in a miraculous 52 days. The butler did it. Nehemiah had, shall we say, an extraordinary organizational skills. You know, most big construction projects run millions of dollars over budget and weeks or months or years over uh, time. But Nehemiah got things organized. Attending the church presbytery meeting yesterday, I was reminding of the oxymoron of organized religion. It was actually a good meeting, but, uh, you know, somebody told me they didn't like organized religion. I said, well, come to my church. <laughs> We've been trying to get organized for 125 years, and we haven't really gotten all the way there yet. But Nehemiah got things organized. See, the Hebrews in Jerusalem had gotten in the bad habit of not taking the Torah very seriously. And having Ezra, and now Nehemiah in town, was sort of like having your high school principal go along on the year and a ride with the class. You act different when the principal is there. You act different when the prophets are in town. So the people knew they had to obey the prophets. It wasn't easy, but the butler did it. Robert Frost recognized the importance of good walls. In his poem, The Mending Wall, he writes, Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun, makes gaps even two can pass abreast. And when this particular farmer, the hero of the story, begins to repair the wall, his neighbor just pitches in just helps out. Sharing the work, they only not, not only stabilize the boundaries between their properties, they ensure that their dogs don't get into the neighbor's yard. Uh, by building good walls together, Frost said, they become better neighbors and good friends. And so the final line, good fences make good neighbors. Making good neighbors was part of Nehemiah's genius. Like Ezra, he was also interested in rebuilding the community. He got people to repair the walls that were in, literally, their backyards. People like Ezra and Nehemiah get books in the Bible, named after them. We don't. A lot of people were lucky they even got their name in the Bible, let alone a book named after them. But a lot of names appear in the third chapter of Nehemiah's book. They are heroes. They are the ones who have been content through history to let Nehemiah, let Ezra take the credit for rebuilding the walls, but they are the ones who actually did the work. They were not content, or they were content to be Nehemiah's construction crew. The, the walls could have not have been rebuilt without them. There are, in fact, they are more like us than they are like me. Just, just ordinary people, by and large, trying to do our part. We're not Ezra. We're not Nehemiah. We're not Martin Luther. We're not Martin Luther King. We're not Jeremiah. We are not Mother Teresa. People have become famous because of their contributions to the faith. We are not like them. Merimoth, son of Uriah, gets his name in. We are like Merimoth, Zadok, and Meshulam. We are the Meshulams of our time. Because we're just regular people. We're contributing in our own ways, in our own backyards, in the coming of the kingdom and the restoration of the righteousness of God, which is God's will for all of creation. We're just doing our part. Pastor Adam says the most important and amazing part of their story was that 
they did not, what they did not only sounds like no big deal, but it was in fact no big deal. They just worked on the part of the, the wall that was near their backyard, brick by brick. Day by day, they did the part where they were. Well, I'm sure it didn't look like this, but Adam says she loves the picture of everybody going out their back door, past the clothesline, and the swing set, and the vegetable garden, and doing some work on the wall that afternoon, on that portion of the broken down wall that their property was on. There's Merrimoth, waving to Zadok, who was working on his own part of the wall, and Zadok next to Meshulam. Then came the day that Zadok's work and Meshulam's work came together. They were joined. Neighbor's labor met neighbor's labor, and the holy city was secure again. Adam says she likes to think that when it was all done, they had a big barbecue, a picnic, and got a bounce house for the kids. <laughs> Something similar happens when we build the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Then it becomes incredibly encouraging for the people of faith like us who care so much and are concerned that we can really only do so little. Maybe it's as though the dogged everyday faithfulness of our modern day down to earth Christians right here where we live uh, can be taken and participate in the restoration of God's people. As the wall was built person by person, family by family, one beam at a time, one brick, one door, one step. So God's love surely is similarly manifested among us, deed by deed, day by day. We heard the Apostle Paul's words on love, building that love a little bit every day is what we are tasked with. So that is the gracious and the, the, the most hopeful story we can ever hear. Who among us has not felt overwhelmed by the world and the, the forces of evil and chaos that seem to be arrayed against us by the enormity of the task at hand of making peace, of the problem of faithlessness, of injustice, by its sheer heartlessness, its hunger, its poverty, inexcusable things. And many have asked ourselves, who am I to make a difference? What can I do against global giants? Who am I to fight against what seems, the power that seems to have the run of the earth? See, something there is that does not like the wall. The Jews said, we don't need a wall. We have the protection of the king of Persia. Why to go to all that effort? Those people from distant lands who had come to live around Jerusalem did not love a wall. They said, don't put up that wall. They remembered the former days when Jerusalem was a mighty walled city. They did not want to see that again. See, so many big and little concerns, disagreements, that is what stops us from together building a wall. I'm sure the enemy laughs with delight when we're confused, when we get tired, when we get weary of the bickering, disgusted with the manufactured hate and polarization we see in our world today. I was talking to City Councilman Lisa Fitzgibbons last week, and she said, you know, I wish that politics wasn't so political. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm so going to use that in a sermon. <laughs> And I said, I think this is what she meant, that we can politicize everything. A pandemic, our theology, human rights. Why do politics have to be so polarizing? See, all those things are just enough to keep you from even wanting to get started. But it was Gandhi who said that whatever you do may seem insignificant to you, but the most important thing is that you 
do it. You will never know what God can do with your little contribution. How God can take your witness and her witness and his witness and put them together to make a stronger, more durable witness than you ever could before or on your own. And it never really looks like much until it's finished. You might be standing in your kitchen chopping vegetables for a salad you're going to send to the homeless shelter. You might be writing a letter to your politician in Washington, a person in power who you're pretty sure never opens their mail. And it never looks like much, but that is how God's reign is established. God takes what we do and puts it in the mix. And all of our little efforts together become the brick and the mortar of God's tomorrow. We can feel overwhelmed by the world. We can be stunned into inaction. What can we do? You see the homeless on the corner sleeping outside even when it's cold. What can we do about it? You see the troops massing along a border, 100,000 strong. And what can we do? There's a documentary on World War II. Uh, you find all sorts of them on Netflix now. You could never uh, watch enough if you wanted to. The, but the focus of the show was on the Soviet Union. The loss of life that the Soviet Union experienced in the war was overwhelming. It, 20 million people killed. The documentary cameras panned to a stark monolith like the Soviets used to like to build uh, erected as memorials for the war, they seemed then to focus on a fresh-faced young married couple, just married, who were laying a bouquet of tulips at the feet of the statue of a soldier's tomb. See, it had become a tradition there. It had become custom, a good luck sign for couples as they begin their lives together. The bride and groom didn't look much different than American couples on their wedding day. Same hopes, same dreams. And it was such a little thing, a few flowers. But that was their way of asking for peace, for shalom, for compassion, for your neighbor, forgiveness, for a, respect, for a friend, respect for your spouse community service to your city or your town, stewardship to your church, a little generosity here or there, where you live. In such ways, our story is told. The story about, uh, similar to the story of Nehemiah, the king's butler who decided to change occupations and became a, a construction boss over in Jerusalem and with God's help and everybody's little contributions. The butler did it. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, let us show your love, that love that is unfailing that we heard about from Corinthians, that love uh, shower us with your love so that we may show it to others and others may see just by who we are and what we do our love for you and in all things so be Deo Gloria to God alone be the glory
But God can take it and, and build it into something beautiful and worthwhile. The salvation of the world. With joy we offer our gifts to God as a sign of our deep devotion and covenant faithfulness. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we thank you for gifts that belong not to us alone, but to all our sisters and brothers, since they too are created in your image. Let their need become our need. Let their hunger become our hunger, and grant to us also a portion of their pain, so that in sharing ourselves we discover the Christ who walks with our brothers and sisters. In his name we pray. Amen.